All right. Good morning or good evening. I said good morning. I'm so used to saying good morning in this place. Good evening. Uh, recording for Bible study. Of course, I don't know what time you're watching this video. You may be watching it tomorrow morning or a few days from now in the morning. So good morning, good afternoon, and good night, just in case uh, I, I'll catch it whatever time you watch this. Uh, here we are at Exodus chapter 20 again. We're on the Ten Commandments. We are on the Third Commandment. If you have the Westminster Larger Catechism Catechism Packet, we're going to be on question uh, 111, 111. And if you don't have that, go ahead and Google it, and uh, you can find a PDF of that, and that's where we'll be. So question 111 and Exodus chapter 20. Let's pray, and then we will, we'll, we'll jump right in. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for... Uh, for a time when we can come together again, uh, studying your word together. I ask that you, you guide us and uh, just a blessing upon this time as we, as we study your word, as we listen to what you have to say to us. And, and I pray as we're guided in, in understanding uh, what this commandment meant and what it means for us today. So I just pray that you uh, just use this time to speak deeply into our hearts and to guide us as we study together. Pray a blessing, Father, for all those uh, gathered and listening and, and studying your word together during this time. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, Exodus chapter 20. Let's read where we've been. So we'll start at verse 1 of Exodus uh, chapter 20, and that'll take us through verse 6. And then today we'll, we're going to pick up verse 7. So Exodus 20, uh, starting at verse 1. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Remember as we're reading that verse 2, I, I love that, that, that first part. It's like he's reminding us of where he brought us out of, uh, what we've come out of, and, and where we're headed. And here's a list of some rules and some, some boundaries, some foundational things to, to start this new life in, in a new place, in a new land. That's the context. Verse 3 then. Uh, is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, you shall ha not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's where we've been so far, and today we're picking up the third commandment, which is Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, that says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Now, now I'm going to go to that Westminster Larger Catechism. Again, if you have that, we're just going to walk right through these questions and just make some notes and observations as we go through. So the third commandment, you shall not uh, misuse, uh, take the name of the Lord in vain, misuse the name of the Lord. Uh, if you have that Dr. Uh, Coker book, Words of Endearment, he, he, he translates this and, and talks about how literally from the Hebrew, it, it has the meaning of that we shall not lift up or carry the name of God unto emptiness or into meaningless things. So don't lift up, don't carry my name into emptiness or to meaningless. I, I like thinking about, so don't misuse or take the name of the Lord in vain. I like the image of don't carry my name into meaningless. And thinking about how we are, we are children of God if we carry his name, the name of God, wherever we go. So don't carry my name into meaningless things. Uh, Dr. Coker makes some good observations related to the importance of a name. You think Old Testament, the Jewish people, I mean, their name, that was a part of their identity with God. It, it meant something. Um, still cultures would probably do it, and maybe you, uh, some of us, we, we've been named for a particular reason, but a lot of times in our culture, now we've, we've lost a little bit of that, and we just kind of, well, we picked a name because we really liked it, and it, it doesn't have necessarily a deep-rooted, connected meaning with our faith, but in the Old Testament in particular, I mean, your name meant something. That's why when you get to a book like Daniel, and you see that they were taken out of the land of Israel and taken into uh, a captivity, one of the first things that always happened was they renamed them. They gave them a new name because they're stripping them their, of their identity uh, in their relationship with God. So in the scriptures, the importance of name is, is vitally important. 
Uh, maybe our name that we've been given or that we choose or give for our children, it's not as, as, um, as important and maybe tied to our faith as it was in the Old Testament. However, I think we need to keep and still capture the importance of the of the name. You know, I tell my kids a lot, like, remember, you, you represent our name. Or remember, we represent the name of, of God. We as a church, we, we represent, we carry his name. And so it's it's vitally <clears throat> it's vitally important. He has a, uh, in Dr. Coker's book, uh, Words of Endearment, he has he quotes from Shakespeare here. Let me get a little uh, little little Shakespearean here. If I can, I don't know. He's quoting uh, Othello. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But in Othello, he, uh, there's this quote. He who steals my name, he steals a value. Who steals my, he who steals my purse, he steals my trash. Tis something, tis nothing. But he that filches... He that steals, we don't use words like, he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. So you can take my purse, but you've just taken my trash. But if you take my name, you've not gained anything for you, but you've robbed me of everything. So this is this quote from Shakespeare that he gives us that our name is so important. And so that ties into this. God says, don't misuse my name. Don't carry my name into uh, meaningless uselessness. That, that's the commandment. Uh, the, the, the name of God, the, the value of, of his name and, and the meaning of his name. Question 112 then says, so, so, so the commandment is don't you misuse or carry the name into, into meaningless, meaninglessness. What does the third commandment require? And here's the answer that uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism gives. The third commandment requires the holy and reverent use in our thoughts, our meditations, our words, and writings of God's name of God's titles, qualities, regulations, word, sacraments, prayer, oaths, vows, casting lots, his works, and anything else which makes himself known. This treatment will be reflected in holy affirmations of our faith and conduct that matches our affirmations to the glory of God and the good of ourselves and others. It, it requires a holy and reverent use in essentially everything that we say and do. We'll give you a few scriptures uh, with this. Some of these maybe are noted in, in the footnotes of your, uh, of your catechism there. Psalm 115, verse 1. We saw this one last week, uh, I think actually in this study, but also in the sermon. Not to us, O Lord, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Isaiah 26, verse 8. Isaiah 26, verse 8. We, we wait for you. Your name and your remembrance, your, your renown, your fame are the desire of our soul. I love that one. Like we, your name, the name of God and your fame, your remembrance, that is the desire of my soul. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I love the Apostle Paul reminds us there that everything that we say and do, to take Dr. Coker talking literally Hebrew understanding there, is, is essentially carrying the name of God. So everything we say and do uh, in, in our thoughts and meditations, words, writings, are, are all reflective of how we are honoring the name of God. And then Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, again, we saw this last week in the Sermon on the Mount. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, respect for uh, keeping uh, in high honor uh, the name of God in our thoughts, our meditations, our words, and, and in our writings. Um, essentially, I think what we're saying is, is that we are representing the, the name of God. We, we carry, we represent the name. Uh, the scriptures talk about how we're commissioned, we're, uh, we're called to be witnesses, we're called to be ambassadors, to be representatives. We represent the, the name of God in everything that we say and do. I mean, certainly that's, that's a, a huge task. 
Let me give you one other scripture here. Uh, I didn't, those ones I just jotted down. Let's turn to this one. It's a little longer. Ezekiel chapter 36. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36. And verses 22 to 27. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 27. Therefore, this is God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. If you read the surrounding context there, in particular the, the, the previous verses in 36, he's speaking about their conduct, about their character, about their heart, and how they were neglecting the things that they were called to do to, to honor and to represent the, the name of God, of, of Yahweh. So he goes, so, so what I'm about to do, I'm going to act, but it's not for your sake. It's for the sake of my holy name, which you've profane, profaned. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations in which you have profaned, profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all of your idols. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all of my rules. <clears throat> Your conduct and your character are not reflective and representing of, of my name, he said. And so I'm, I'm about to act. I'm going to do something. And it's not for your sake. It's, it's, to, it's to protect and, and to redeem and to lift up my holy name. And as that section ends, he says, I'm putting a new heart in a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. And I want you to obey and to follow my rules. Be, because, again... What does this commandment require? Essentially, it's saying that we represent and think about how everything that we say and do uh, represents and carries the, the name of God. What does then, the next question, <clears throat> what does this third commandment forbid? So I think we could summarize and, and say, what does it require? It requires us just to keep in mind that everything that we say and do, we represent and carry the name of God. So what does it forbid? It forbids us not using God's name as is required, the abuse of it through ignorance, empty or unholy treatment, irreverence, superstition, or any wicked reference to his titles, qualities, regulations, or works, blasphemy, perjury, all sinful cursing, oaths, vows, and casting lots, violating our oaths and vows if lawful, and keeping them if aimed at unlawful things. So just pausing here a second, it's forbidding the, again, the misuse in the ways in which we would carry or, or speak in ways that would dishonor God. I, I, I happen to, to like the, the, in thinking about the word ignorance there, because a lot of times we can say, well, I didn't know. There's a lot of things that we could do that, that could kill us. But it's, the excuse can't be, well, I just didn't know. You, you, didn't, you need to learn and you need to know. And there's some things that we need to understand because there are some great powers around us or electricity or things that you could be working with. Well, I just didn't know. Man, that could kill you. And so you, you've, we got to have some wisdom. And when handling and navigating the word of God and who God is, I, I just thought, I don't know, that the word ignorance really kind of drew me in a little to say I, I want we need to have wisdom and understanding about who this God is and the power of God. <clears throat> in particular, this next one got me too. Uh, com I underlined this section here. Complaining, if, so it, the third commandment forbids complaining and quarreling about our misapplication of God's decrees and acts of providence, as well as unwarranted curiosity about them, misinterpreting or misapplying God's word or perverting all or part of its meaning in any way. Complaining, correlating, or quarreling or about or misapplying God's decrees or act of providence is, is, a, is an unwarranted curiosity about them. Uh, you know, thinking that we have God's word figured out. I mean, we're living in a time and a season where everybody, uh, uh, things maybe didn't go the way you thought that they should go in terms of, of, of the 
presidential vote and things that are happening and boy scripture starts getting misapplied misinterpreted and people start saying boy we know this is happening we know that's happening and God's coming back and God's judging and we just know and they start using scripture in the wrong kind of ways just with with there I want to put a little little scripture just to, to see how it kind of I think plays out a little Acts chapter 1 uh, 6 to 11 uh, Jesus has uh, has risen from the dead. He's talking with the disciples, getting ready to go back up into heaven. And in Acts 1, verse 6, it says, So they came together and they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, is this the time? Is this the date? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. It's, it, 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 it's nothing you need to worry about. The the uh, we're, we're, the third commandment, this says, forbids um, misinterpreting and misapplication the acts of providence and unwanted curiosity about them. Jesus is telling disciples here, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Uh, when we go through rough stuff in life, you've got a lot of, you know, prophets coming up and speaking about when God's coming back, and what's happening. Jesus clearly say, here says, it's not for you to know, but... You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons, not to get worked up about uh, prophecies and what's happening here. You're called to be my witnesses, which kind of sounds also like, go represent my name. Go, go live for me in all things. Continue reading here. It also forbids blasphemy, mockery, mockery, or blasphemous mockery of his word, pointless arguing, meaningless talk, supporting false doctrines, abusing God's name, his creatures, or anything included under his name in the practice of magic or to promote sinful desires and activities, maligning, scorning, reviling, or opposing in any way God's truth, grace, and actions. This one got to pretending to be religious or using religion for evil purposes. Um, I won't name a the name, but there's there's a, a famous Christian uh, person that uh, got found out was doing a lot of things they shouldn't have been do doing. And one of the comments the person made is that they found that it was easier to become successful and get in the door of a church than it was on a public stage in the secular world. They said that, like, boy, that rubbed me the wrong way. So you use the church to to promote your name to become famous, and unfortunately was doing a lot of things behind the scenes that were not good. Don't pretend to be religious or use religion and act in the name of God for evil purposes. Uh, don't be, uh, it forbids being ashamed of God's name or ashamed to it uh, uh, by stubbornly refusing to obey him and by living unwisely, unfruitfully, or in such a way as to offend him or backslide away from him. So those are some of the reasons given. Again, this is why I think this is such a treasure to see the in-depth nature that they go into each command and thinking about what does it require, what does it forbid. And then the last question is, what reasons are added to the third commandment? And very similar to last week, the reason added is because God, this is the Lord our God, and his name must never be treated as unholy or misused by us in any way particularly since he's so opposed to acquitting or sparing those who break this commandment that he will not allow them to escape his righteous judgment, even though many who do break the commandment escape human condemnation and punishment. I wrote a line and a little note to myself under there and circled the word human condemnation. People who break this command may escape human con con condemnation, but we need to remember that we stand before a holy God and we will stand before a holy God and to be to think about how we are representing and caring and living his name. So I wrote just a little summary for myself to think about. Ask yourself for yourself. What, so what does this command require? What does it forbid? What are the reasons for it? And that's all well and good if we answer these questions and go through this and say, yeah, I agree with all that. Um, I know what it requires. I know what it forbids. I know the reasons. That's important. But equally, if not personally, even more important, what does this command mean to you and I? And, and how will we live it?
What does it mean to you and I and how we live it? For me, this speaks deeply. This command speaks deeply into the posture of our hearts. And it's deeper than at least how I grew up. It's, it's deeper than just, hey, when you hit your thumb when, with a hammer, don't say God out, like scream God. Like that's what I feel like the, the, the majority of what this command was when I was a kid. Don't take God's name in vain, which means when something bad happens, don't yell like God. And then if you were really radical as a Christian, you would tell other people not to do that when you heard them. I remember feeling so guilty because I was never willing as like a high school student to tell somebody that used to, one of my friends that would always say God out, you know, and using it in vain like that. And I would never feel that I could tell them, hey, don't use my Savior's name in vain. That's abuse. Like I wasn't a radical Christian. I, I think it's actually deeper than that. It's, it's deeper. We, we like surface level, though, and so that's like surface level. This is deep to my heart. It's, 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 it's a command that takes me into thinking about everything that I say and do, and even in the, the meditations of my own heart. It takes me into my home, where I shut the door behind me. It takes me to my private life, where, where we sometimes think it's okay to dishonor his name with actions, complaints, thoughts, words, actions, stuff we watch, stuff we click on. To revere his name is not to associate with such things because I carry his name. It's not to say things. It's not to act in certain ways. And so this, this command requires, I think, that I ask, do, does this thing, fill in the blank, does this honor his name? Fill it. I put everything in there. Whatever it is, does this honor his name? Do I just preach, proclaim, send cool little tweets and hashtag sayings in his name and then go behind closed doors and say and do all sorts of things that don't honor his name? Because that's not revering his name. Do I carry his name and do I hold it up in my heart and in my conduct and in my words and in my life? That's what I think it means to 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 carry the name of God and to keep and to hold on to this command. So blessings to you as you study and as you spend some time with these questions. God bless you guys.